just received a text from Nate saying that he uh, inadvertently went to Denfeld because we've been holding our meetings at Denfeld and we knew that that might happen. So he is on his way here and will be here shortly for the presentation. No problem. Appreciate that. So we're going to go to our next um, pres uh, presentation. And Cherlo, well, this is for you, actually. It is for a discussion. We are at 3A, 3A our structure of school board committees, and uh, the presenter is uh, Cheryl, so I'll turn it over to you, Cheryl. Thank you. This did not look that unfamiliar to many of us that have sat been on the board, maybe members of LC, you know, will be on the journey tonight. It's on the agenda, just um, as a heads up. There is no, we're not asking for it to be any formal placement on a school board meeting or for any formal changes yet. But, in the past six to eight months or so, this is our second year 
uh, committed a whole policy and based our finance. I think we're going into our third year now of having a committee structure like this. And it's just kind of a review. I think we went into it uh, knowing that we had, we made some significant changes. We brought in a policy committee um, because we had done some research and thought that that was a, 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 good, a good committee to have. We actually then kind of took a step back um, and didn't have an education committee necessarily called that with just three board members on that committee. Um, we combined our HR finance, HR used to be its own separate committee and so did finance, but we combined those two. And um, I think those committees have been working, you know, very effectively and productively and I think those are great committees. Um, I've just gotten feedback from time to time, not often. I, again, this is not some big alarm or anything that we as board miss the ability to have conversations um, in, in, in not detail, detail, but in depth on some of the issues brought up either in our HR or in our finance or in our um, policy that doesn't always fit so nicely into our school board meeting. It's supposed to flow where, you know, policy is worked on and then it flows into our school board meeting and we either adopt or send back to work. Same thing with our HR finance. So, I don't think this needs to take longer than five or six minutes. Is there any desire on the part of the board to kind of look at anything different? Any observations you had? And if you'd like to see this on the agenda sometime down the road, we certainly have a lot more on our plate than what we want now. Another sentence. When it comes to a general political committee, I think there are places where it doesn't hurt to have two members present or three members present. If you have members that have a history um, and knowledge um, and an institutional knowledge of what's going on in some of those communities, that, that they have that opportunity to be their own community with some others, maybe uh, a new member to that community. Or, I, I, I just think we need to keep open that opportunity for board members to be with this on committees that there's uh, still, still room for another person. And I don't think it affects the, 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 the function of those committees. Now there are still maybe some committees that are something like that where they really are not going to be present. I don't know how it works. But, uh, but you know, when it comes to uh, equity committees and the board. With some other committee that this might serve board well to have a second member who can also be present and, 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 and help keep the board in front. Yeah, I don't, I don't know. I have to, we'd have to ask the policy committee to do some work on whether or not that's a, something that would need a policy change. Is there a policy that we only have one member? I mean, it certainly can be Well, if there's no the policy, for how many members are on. Uh, I mean, obviously, for uh, the um, uh, human HR finance and, and policy committee, there's a reason you don't have to be present at the time of the board. It becomes a full board and stuff. So, but when it comes to the other committees, I, I think, again, if we have board members that are interested and willing to participate in those committees and have, again, strong desires and or institutional knowledge that that served that committee well, they should be given that opportunity to continue to serve on that committee. Other, other uh, yeah, that's fine. I, I wasn't, I mean, we can have a conversation about committees too, because really, yeah, I, I think that there maybe are some conversations about the committees that we currently have on our list and why are they there. They, I've done that all the way to about 20, 12 in my, well, like you can research it on board book to see what committees we had in 2012 and 2013 and 2014 and you know we've always had this one um, and so I don't know if that's just tradition or if it's policy or if there's, that, would, that might even be a question for Terry Morrow, wouldn't know that but you know like is there, if there are three board members 
on, let's just say, the um, intergovernmental, because right now we do have three, and that, that might be in violation, because maybe that becomes a committee, and then we force intergovernmental to be public and take minutes and post their agenda. And I don't think that's the intent of, right now, Frank Jewell is running it in a street of and I don't think that's their intent. I think their intent mm -hmm. is to have a, a vehicle to have conversation between the city council, county, West, and the school district. So that would certainly be a question we could ask and a city. And I, yeah, I can do that. I, I just typed in by saying, I, I, I think when I look at that list of committees, there might be some say, I'm, I'm just going to throw up the transfer committee, where I'm not sure why there couldn't be two people on that. Um, there might be some committees, and, and I, I'm interested to hear from Nick with uh, the equity committee, if according to their bylaws, they specify, you know, one person. Um, you know, that, that could be the case. Um, uh, and, um, but I, I think we should explore with Terry Morrow. I, I would assume that just I actually did spend some time looking at other uh, school board committees, community committees, and, and saw how, you know, they generally just had one person, and I'm, I'm wondering if it's just more, you know, the amount of time people want to contribute um, as well. And certainly I think there are some committees where they don't, if there's two people, they probably wouldn't want it to be seen as you go one month, I go another month. You know, they might want that consistency. So I think it's worth exploring, um, particularly for some of the internal committees. Um, but it would also be good to get some feedback from um, NFCA on kind of their thoughts on it. Well, really, just the legal part. That's what I'd be yeah. more interested in. I have a feeling we can do whatever we want to do as committees as long as we stay on the, the right policy side. I have to tell you, though, I didn't put this on the agenda for the committee assignments you just gave us today or yesterday. That's not why this is on here, but I, I certainly am interested in conversation about the committee assignments that just came out at some point. Um, but that wasn't the intent of tonight. Tonight was just simply to look at um, whether or not we feel the, like there are times when I think the committee as a whole, like tonight, this meeting should come after policy and HR so that if we want to put something, this committee as a whole can also, it doesn't have to be always filled, although I love what Assistant Superintendent Bob brings to our committee as a whole, it doesn't have to always be filled with educational topics like our education committee. It can be a work session where right now if we wanted to set out a, a, a committee, then it, we, we could have that on our call committee, but um, I just think that the flow isn't as helpful. I'm going to go to, to see if you since you've got a lot of history about how we work through this. Thank you, um, Chair Lopal. And you just said what I was going to share was that um, the intention was prior to the creation of the Committee of the Whole and having the Educational Committee, um, we found challenges sometimes of filling that agenda and then we knew that there were several things that were on the education committee agenda that the full, all the board needed to know about because uh, they were going to be taking action on it through resolutions and other things and so it had just been brought up as a suggestion to just convert that to a committee as a whole this all happened during the Stillwater incident of having full board members attending committee meetings where we were breaking open meeting law and so we had to make a decision on whether they were committees or <coughs> whole board committees, which was why we kind of did some shifting to make a committee of the whole so that all board members could participate. And the original intention was to have a wide range of topics, not necessarily just educational, so that um, if there were things that the whole board needed to hear or were interested in, and we often, like you know, we add committees of the whole in the spring just to talk about budget. Um, because we know that's important and we want the whole board to be a part of that. And I was going to echo exactly, it does feel like the timing of when this meeting is versus when our other meetings are, it would be great to have the committee of the whole following so that if we wanted to filter it through the committee of the whole or work session before the regular board meeting, that would be fantastic because that could be a way for us to transfer that information so we don't have to wait for the board meeting to be able to kind of do that review. Um, so thanks for sharing that. And I just echo that exact uh, thought where maybe we could have a consideration of 
um, the restructuring of the timing of those meetings would be awesome. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I would agree to have the committee of the hall after the two meetings. Um, I think sometimes, uh, for example, um, uh, e even when you're doing the HR Finance Committee, that some of those items, um, you know, the budget is one example, but there's been many others I can think of that I wish would have been presented to the whole uh, school board as well, not just to that committee. So I, I can see having the flow different to help allow for that. So um, I don't know if we, you said we're not interested in making any decisions, but you know, could we try it out for a month or something to just so that we're not 
flipping the switch immediately would be helpful. To uh, Member Sanholm's question related to number of people on committees, I, I was just taking a look at, at uh, our, a number of our school board policies, uh, including the, the uh, 213 series on, on uh, school board uh, committee bylaws and didn't see anything that would uh, necessarily, you know, say that uh, the part, you know, community action committee has one member and the uh, educational equity committee needs to have two. It didn't, it didn't outline it specifically, but this is the next practice. The, 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 the community action one is kind of separate because it's based on their policy. So well, there are, there are sorry, a couple yeah. of those that are, are yes. based on the policies of other yeah, other yeah. mm -hmm. So not the bad one. <laughs> uh, and the, and the uh, my comment has more to do with uh, some of the generic of these not what uh, which can we have. And I think that we think this one to make the whole process more efficient. And it seems to me that you know, the committee uh, ought to Oh, research and discuss important issues just before the board, and then make recommendations to the whole board to stick and then act on it. And it doesn't seem to be that happening. They try to find out to say, this is what we recommend as the report. No, that doesn't do. Uh, now, the educational part of it for the community, wherever, that's fine, but that's mm -hmm. a different mm -hmm. kind of thing. And, and some of these committee meetings are just taking so long. Uh, I think that we need to look at that. Uh, not that education yeah. is important, yeah. but I'm not sure that the committee, even this committee, is for that. You know, they have a bunch of presentations that say, well, that's good, but what issue are we really looking at that we need to look at? I think it should focus more on specific issues, like, well, the budget one for sure, but uh, boundary changes or COVID or whatever they are, they're before they're And then what, what is the desire of the board to? Like, um, I think sometimes our, our board leadership is looking for us, uh, to us for direction. Like, can I use the power committee meeting next month to do a presentation on finances and budget? Or do I have to have a special board meeting because there are other things? So, um, yeah, yeah. It, it, again, I was just putting this out there because it's January and we are looking at. Um, that we've been on this model for a while. Um, my thought is, is I, I would agree with the work session model. However, I would not want the work session model to just be a place for conversation for those people that weren't in the common committee. You know, oh, yeah. If you know what I'm saying, um, that you know the committee will still meet and then you come to the work session and the only people with extra questions are the people that weren't present. <laughs> that aren't assigned to that committee. And so it, it just seems so much more simplistic to have everybody at the committee and not have committees. But that that needs to streamline it in my head. I don't know how else to not create that kind of pyramid structure that seems inefficient as members of the department vote. Um, but I'm not saying it would be efficient either because you know, we could all get caught up in all different stuff anyway. Um, as you know, you know, you kind of work. But as being in those kind of things prior to, yeah, I didn't talk. As we have been in those meetings before when we had those kind of things. So um, I don't know that there's a perfect solution, but I do know that people that aren't at those committee meetings are missing out on, on a whole heck of a lot. And it's not part of the job that's required of us to do a walk through things and perhaps come up with a question. It's our job to be there to question. So that's my thing. I'm going to add two cents because I know my community is walking through it. I, I want it to be my job. I, you can choose whatever you want. I just want my, I, I, I think it is my job. Personally, maybe not because I'm the chair, but I don't think so. To watch the HR finance committee or to watch the policy—that is my responsibility. My my opinion. I don't think it's written anywhere. Um, I honor Member Oswald and hers, and I would come to the 
work session or the committee to hold with with some questions. I mean, sometimes not, you know. Um, but it's, I, I, you know, I think it all depends on what's here on the agenda. I don't think that the work session should, should necessarily just recap everything that was on a policy and set out that policy policy. But I might have some input as a coach and as a teacher on that policy. So I might come to that meeting having watched you guys and and ask some more questions or just share it and maybe that wouldn't be the, the major focus of a work session. The major, major focus work of the work session, I would think, are some of these more pressing topics. Like, you know, David said, you know, we, we've got a lot of things that we could get, get that. So, but thank you. Thank you. That's all of the time I really want to take. And again, I think I'm hearing, but, you know, you can give me some feedback right now or wait, that even looking at our general school district committees, everything from the Parks and Rec to the Federal Programs Advisory Committee, and just make sure that um, we're following the policy and that we're following an open meeting um, guidelines from, from from the legal standpoint and, you know, a conversation with the people that this involves. So, you know, the Head Start po Policy Council, you know, working with Jerry Williams, maybe he would tell us that, yeah, it would be worth having an alternate on there and they would serve, you know, um, maybe they'd only come to a few meetings and then they're ready to go on to the next. So almost all of these could have an alternate that doesn't necessarily have to be there, but comes in and training and then they move up to the, to the top slot and bring in another alternate. But again, all things we could discuss. Thank you. Thanks for your feedback. A work session in the meeting. So I turn it back to Assistant Superintendent Bond and let you know that um, um, Nathan Smith has arrived. Oh, so we will go back to um, the very first item, Nate Smith. Uh, Nate, if you want to come up and um, present the EAC bylaws. Sounds good, Mr. Bond. Thank you, guys. Thank you, sir. Everyone, so this poor chair, like right here. There. Right. <laughs> I'm excited to be here on the event, so of course, it's just, yeah, have it. Hi everyone. Um, you all got the proposed and uh, the current bylaws for the Act, the Education Equity Advisory Committee. So I'll explain just a little bit about uh, why this draft of the proposed the Act bylaws was sent to you. So the Act is the Education Equity Advisory Committee. It's been around in the district in different forms for around 40 years or so. Um, and it exists um, by state statute. It's supposed to we're supposed to have it. Rule 3535 requires us to have a community collaboration council to give feedback on how like the achievement and integration plan, um, and also just to provide like feedback and advice to the school board and the school district on issues of equity and opportunities around equity. So, for the last 10 years or so, though, it's been um, what I've what I've learned is that. Uh, under the current bylaws, um, it really has uh, restricted and restrained the opportunity for this group of people to to uh, get feedback to the school board and to the school district in, in meaningful ways. So, and part of the reason is is because uh, the membership um, requirements, and you'll see within the current and the proposed bylaws. Um, the new bylaws allow for a lot more inclusive participation and uh, memberships um, for students, members of the community, staff, uh, parents, everyone to be able who is interested and invested in issues of equity um, to come to the monthly e equity to, to to give advice and to collaborate with others. Um, and we haven't been able to do that for the last 10 years. Um, and part of the reason is the current membership uh, requires representatives from different committees. Um, only one of them currently is the American Indian Parent Advisory Committee, which uh, we had our first uh, informal EAC kind of gathering last month in December. And we had representatives from 
the community and from the NAACP and from the staff in the school district and, and parents um, and also representatives from the American Indian Parent Committee. So the current bylaws, which exist now, um, require membership from the African American Educational Advisory Committee. We don't have one. Requires representatives from the Asian Pacific Educational Advisory Committee and from the Edelon Bay Educational Advisory Committee. And so we don't have any of those committees, so that's part of the dysfunction for the last um, 10 years or so that we haven't been able to be uh, productive and, and having that role in providing the school board you know, advice and recommendations um, from you know, the community's point of view, from staff and students and people's point of view because we can't be a forum. We can't be a forum without active members, and we can't have active members from groups that don't exist. So you'll see one of the big differences between the proposed and the current bylaws it allows for a lot more inclusive membership um, with still a goal to achieve participation from a diverse um, range of individuals. And from our first informal meeting in December, we really kind of were gaining a lot of steam and a lot of momentum. And um, the network of uh, equity allies is just it's, it's exploding. I mean, we're getting people from you know more people from the NAACP that want to participate. Organizations like the YMCA, YWCA, Men of Peacemakers, um, and so. For us to continue though to have like formal EAC meetings, that would be my request here for you know this week, how meeting here to make a recommendation to the school board to pass the provisional EAC bylaws um, with the understanding that they're more inclusive and they also allow for greater participation in terms of the uh, the design of how the meetings are run and that the meetings um, um, use consensus basically as a um, like a decision making tool versus not a smooth order which is what has previously been um is inside the current bylaws um, so i know like the american Indian parent committee got rid of robert's rules of orders uh, in their bylaws i don't know if that happened but i've been going to their meetings uh, lately and they made their own bylaws similar to these provisional proposed bylaws. I didn't make these. So EAC has had like three or four members for the past you know, four or five years um, whose membership came and came together and they made these with the idea to increase participation, uh, make the uh, committee more inclusive. Um, so I came into this role in August and as I orient myself to all the rules and requirements and like the mandates of the state to have like a community collaboration council to give you know feedback in areas of equity and opportunities around equity and also feedback around the three-year achievement and integration plan. Um, we, we need to have an effective uh, committee that can you know, can provide that feedback and can provide you know the support for the district and also if we can get these provisional proposed proposed PS bylaws passed, um, it just allows the district itself greater opportunity uh, to tap into diverse communities in a formal way and to get input, um, you know, strategic planning, or operational planning, or if any type of planning. There will be you know, a mechanism in place with an equity group that meets monthly. Um, you know, continuing moving forward. Um, if the bylaws aren't passed, um, I, I don't know, we would have to, we'd have to go a different route in terms of creating, I don't, I don't know what that would look like, creating a, uh, trying to restart and create, you know, committees under the, the current set of bylaws, the African American, or the Asian, Pacific, and Avalanche. I don't know if that would be the right route to go because the, the design of the, the work requiring membership and not equal membership. So like the American Indian, the African American, the district core members, and the Adelante and uh, Latino, that's next, or Asian Pacific Institute. 
And so that system of design is uh, basically just against one another. If you work with them, you have groups working specifically for the goals within that racial cultural group. So within the new proposed provisional bylaws, which you all have, um, anybody who comes basically to the meetings can participate and give input and work towards creating consensus um, towards the equity goals and initiatives that that get presented. These provisional bylaws, they are imperfect. I've read them myself, and I can say that there's opportunities to grow. Like any set of bylaws are imperfect. And we had a two-hour discussion with 30 community members about the bylaws. Uh, but we still got consensus at that meeting, where um, we got a, everyone except for one person. But that person said that they didn't want to sign on it because they, they just kind of wanted to reflect on it. And I wasn't too sure if that's so. But everybody else. We were there, up with the exception of Mr. Mangus and Mr. Bonsu, and myself. I didn't want to, to sign on to uh, the bylaws as I was facilitating the conversation. We got consensus from a large group of, of educators, community members, unanimous consensus from the Education Committee of the NAACP and the President of the NAACP. So we have support moving forward with the provisional bylaws. So, I just wanted to come here to give a little bit of background um, of the act and some of the, uh, you know, the dysfunction that has existed and why that exists and the trajectory which I hope that our district can take this case. So that's kind of my disorganized spiel. <laughs> but I'm open to thoughts, questions, comments. First of all, I would like to uh, take this time to uh, congratulate uh, Mr. Smith on a very successful rebooting of the act. Um, it was well attended and it was a great mix of community members as he described as well as staff members. So I really appreciate about his efforts in rebooting the act and he, and he described uh, a lot of uh, the efforts that he uh, is thinking about and the we were working on, so I just want to say, uh, great job, uh, Nate. So we'll turn it over to uh, board members and others. So um, I have been a participant in EPS for many, many years, since about 2005, and um, I, I saw the decline and the pitting against each other, um, the different groups that, that were wanting to put their own agendas and, and some um, of those groups of the different communities would actually kind of take the lead in hostage and not allow progress um, or boycott going up and stop anything from happening because they knew nothing could happen without a forum and, and so it was just really frustrating for a, a number of years and so I, I wholeheartedly endorsed the whole consensus um, aspect of it, knowing that um, the people that may, may show up there wanting to put in equity instead of FSL, say, um, won't be comfortable in that environment and will not be able to um, get very far with the advocates that we um, if the people that showed up last month will continue to be there. So, um, I have read these bylaws and I want a part of developing them and and um, I've given feedback on them as they, they've gone through a couple of reiterations and, and yeah, they're not they're not perfect, but they're better than what we got. And it's a starting place because we need a new starting place. Um, because equity it has changed in what we want for equity from 20 years ago to now. And this is allowing us to move forward. So I will endorse um, and that. Um, one vote doesn't do it. One vote starts momentum, and every big goal, big dream, big project starts with momentum. And uh, you bring up like a, con a concern that some of the members at that meeting had brought up about people that don't believe in equity coming and kind of sabotage the meeting. And that gets covered in response to an Article 3, Section 3, where it says that he actually remains committed to the recognition of. Negative dynamics of power and privilege present 
present in as many of the isms of our society, 3.1 of the EI shall actively resist these dynamics and manifestations of all EI movements and actions. So those two words, those two phases, um, they're designed to kind of, you know, um, not allow those opportunities for people that may um, want to come from the, you know, sabotage the techniques that come to the world and make it better that way. So I, I, I love the third page at the bottom, the great for Article 5, um, six, that you know, all meetings of this EF shall be open to the public in accordance with Minnesota law. All meetings agendas will be posted on the ISC 709 webpage and copies sent to each school board member. And I really appreciate that as a school board member. So my next question is, what is the role of us if we have a member um, and uh, an alternate? So what is what what do you see the school board's role on staff committee and could a school board member like member Oswald or any of us be uh, a, a part of the act without being a uh, school board member? I mean yes. absolutely because they've been in the board a long time before maybe we're having a school board member. Oh well yeah, it was in two thousand five. Yeah, yeah, yeah it's gonna be uh, the opportunity for school board members make sure that we get that everyone wants to come. I feel that, you know, a lot of the, uh, and not even like not officially, but as just like school board members, that's community members. It was violated at the open meeting level. We can't do that. Posted, but, um, yeah, well, you know, that's what's coming. Cool. Um, and, and I just say that because I feel like our community where we're at is a really large tipping point, and that there's a lot of people in silos you know, doing really great work, and people that have really great ideas, they just need to make a place um, to uh, connect and to collaborate and to work together because I feel like we can push our community and do like, and then it's going to start kind of snowballing into some really great things. Uh, I think about some of the, uh, the goals of bringing equity to our district. Um, they're, they're ginormous goals. I mean, I think about Minnesota having maybe the second worst achievement gap in the United States and we having one of the worst numbers in Minnesota and which makes us one of the like, uh, most challenging districts for opportunities for our diverse students within our entire country. And so as many people that we can get together in a room to, uh, to talk about, you know, the opportunities that, that exist. Because I think there's just tremendous opportunities um, that we get all our great minds together and we talk and the more people so I envision and, and see what we're the proposed bylaws to the opportunity for subcommittee work. So right now, you know, the 30 people that came, all of them want to continue coming. And they all have two or three people that want to continue coming. So then you can get a ginormous group of people working on subcommittees and on equity, you know, opportunities. I don't like, I don't like equity issues, equity opportunities within our district. And, um, the role of the school board, um, and you'll see too, um, that the goal of um, Article 5, that near the top, um, is to list a maximum of four informational items um, that are, are come to by consensus by the active members in attendance. Um, they get pushed to the school board, so it could be just the school board becoming aware of some of the equity opportunities within our district, and then uh, a goal of the EAC meeting to, to possibly generate recommended action items. Um, created by consensus for the participants there um, that get pushed also to the school board, pushed forward to the school board. So my ask to the school board is to be um, open to listening um, and open to, uh, to supporting some of those um, <coughs> equity opportunities and uh, yeah, open to attending and um, connecting with uh, some of the membership and the participants and building uh, relationships because through relationships um, trust and through trust with them um, really accelerates the effectiveness from the work that, that needs to be done. So I think we're going to be able to work on this too. And then let's work with them. Just a follow-up question to that, and I know it's probably just because we just said that and talked about committees, but if, if there was a possibility of having three school board members on EAC, yeah. Um, I'll let them say. I want to say, like, um, do they become voting members? Do they become 
do they just uh, observe with the idea of sharing information back to us? Um, what, what I, again, I'm kind of going back to, and, and, and would that um, be seen? I mean, in, in some of our community, maybe having, you know, board members attend that don't have the history might seem um, like we're, we're there to, to limit or something. So I, I wouldn't want that perception to happen. I'm just trying to give the board, because then I would really encourage the EX committee that's a part of our committee structure to, to you know, that could certainly be a work session topic that you come and give us information on, or some kind of written report that comes back maybe to, to Superintendent Mangus' weekly report when there's something to be shared or something we need to look at. I don't know. I don't know. I'm just trying to figure out what you want from the school board members that are currently on the committee and what it would look like <coughs> if others wanted to. And then is there an expectation that the same members would come to every meeting? Um, all great fantastic questions. Um, so if we had three board members, I think that would be okay. And since the, if, so there's not membership. And that will be a big difference between the current and proposed, it's just it's about participation. So yes, every single person there, and that's why I think we have a lot of voice in the conversations that are happening, um, and don't necessarily have have to be there every single meeting. Um, so part of the dysfunction of the current bylaw that currently exists is if you miss three meetings, um, you, you lose access to membership. Um, so you lost a lot of the great people over here. You know, these members are still out there that have you know, wonderful ideas about, about equity. Um, so and in terms of how we act in the school board can work together, I think that it's a relationship yet to be defined. And I think that this, yeah. this dynamic and the opportunity that, uh, that exists. Um, and that's one thing about that's exciting about, you know, the proposed bylaws is um, it's just, it's all opportunity and it's inclusive opportunity um, and allows participation from you know, school board members, staff, administrators, parents, students. Uh, community members, representatives, uh, community organizations. Um, so the goal is inclusivity, inclusiveness, um, with the idea that everybody has a voice. And it's, it's different in voting, because there's, there's no voting, it's through consensus. I guess we should have attached as a separate attachment, because if there's a link within the uh, this is right under Article 7, where it says a short guide to consensus. Yet, um, consensus is about coming to like a common understanding versus going with the uh, like the majority vote. And so we saw this function within the current bylaws of trying racial groups being pitted against one another because of the Robert rules, the current the current order of majority majority rule. So to say. And then you have a majority of membership that made up two racial groups, and then you have a minority that, by the rules within the bylaws, has no opportunity to get to a majority. Um, you can kind of feel that dynamic. Yeah. I don't know if I answered your question very well. I just wanted to say thank you for clarifying um, why you need to change this. Um, to the participant section specifically, because um, when I first read it, I was a little concerned that it was too open, but now you explained it, it's totally it more clear about making it more inclusive. So thank you for that. Um, I also really appreciate the feedback about the board building relationships and trust um, with the community and listening to ideas. Um, so we will definitely look at that. Um, I didn't get a chance to take a look at the secret change to me, but I just brought it up on my computer since we said that. Um, something that came to mind is, you know, every board meeting, we read the 11 tools of civility. Um, when you're doing consensus, um, it just came to mind that maybe it wouldn't be a bad idea to read I, I, um, I know that these were planned by a local foundation in our area and several organizations and foundations and 
looking at uh, you know, video and nice and recommendations, and if we have you know a group of people who their really passion is equity, uh, and we can tap into them in an organized way, I think it will accelerate our opportunities to uh, bring change, massive change, to the school district that we you know we have signed to for as long as I've been around in the district since 2007. Um, with, with not a lot of change, so I feel like we can have a consistent group, monthly meetings year round, you know, to give advice on the AI plan, but also to give advice and feedback around all issues of equity. I feel like it's uh, an opportunity that, uh, that, as a community and as a district, uh, I feel like we need to be tapping, we need to be tapping into the community that's been regulated around all. Thank you. No, I just wanted to say uh, thank you to, to Nate and as well as to Assistant Superintendent Bonds and his team because I think that uh, you, both of you and along with many others have brought uh, a freshness to the work related to, to equity and I think it's important as um, it's always been important. I think it's even more important now that we've had some of the opportunity, opportunity gaps and in, in, in the inequities widened through the pandemic. I also am appreciative that, that this, the bylaws and the work that's been done um, puts in place some of the structures that we'll need once we finish our equity audit that is being uh, conducted as well, as well as when, when we uh, continue with our strategic planning work in the coming weeks. So just wanted to say thank you. Uh, to Mr. Smith and Mr. Bonds, uh, as well as the others involved for, for the work. And I think that these uh, bylaws will be an ex ex excellent uh, framework for the work to be done. Thank you. Any other questions? Thanks, Mr. Smith. Uh, I'm going to ask my dad watching my kids. I'm going to shoot back and pick them up because I told them we would play before that. I don't want to be too late for uh, and I appreciate each and every single one of you. I think I think together like we're gonna change the world. And I really, really good feeling about it. Like I said, the community is about a fifty point is gonna match it in the right place. And I'm excited if anybody has any follow-up questions, you can reach out to me by email um, or phone, or two eight and eight, call or text me. Um, but yeah, that's what it thank you so much for your time. I really appreciate it and and that's what we love about Nate. He brings that, that extra positivity. <laughs> so, I'll be going to our next item. Um, on our next item on the agenda is our SRO update. So, I just want to give a quick update on the long awaited um, SRO presentation by our news table. Uh, will take place again on February 7th. We've asked people to save that date. Um, February is again September 7th. Excuse me, I keep saying September. February 7th. So February 7th from 5 to 8 o'clock. It's going to be held at Fitkers. So it's going to be held at the Fitkers Complex. And we're really excited about that. So again, February 7th from 5 to 8 o'clock at Fitkers. Uh, please set the date and RSVP once you have the opportunity to do so. You will see uh, flyers coming out uh, later this week, which is tomorrow, um, and you will also see receive some additional information next week regarding how to RSVP. So please do so. Our next item is a presentation by our secondary coordinator, coordinator Anna Kaka. We have, to we have a question, a, um, Mr. Bond. Fiscal year 23 course. Mr. Bond. Update. Sorry, we have a question first related to the SRO update. I just wanted to ask if we could have a um, a Google invite sent to us for the date. Could, so if you get on our calendar for us. Sure. So um, if we could hold, have a hold the date email sent to the board, that would be great. And I also want to say thanks to Mr. Bonds and his, thanks to Mr. Bonds and his team for selecting a, uh, loca a location. There was a first place selected, but we selected this second location because it's on the bus line. It's centrally located, uh, and really thinking about access uh, embodies the equity work that, that uh, 
Mr. Smith had just talked about. Thank you. And now, and now we'll continue with uh, Ms. Kaka's presentation, a riveting presentation on yes. our um, the 2022-23 uh, course changes. So we had for questioning requests as well. We have just under 20 requests. You'll see three on this sheet. Several of those requests were um, math, arts, and PLA related. And even where we are in that standard review cycle, we've got new standards that we're either working on right now or that are coming. So we um, put a pause on those. So they probably will come down the line in the next couple of years. But we wanted to make sure that those changes and new courses were aligned with the new standards that we have. So that's for several of those So the three that you'll see on here were really simple ones. Two of them were both psychology classes have this over the course description change. The reason for that was to provide more adequate detail for them in the course catalog. And then the addition of the college and the schools is the delay three. And so that was to add the college and the schools option and also provide the next level of the course is there going to be a minimum um, number of students required in order to offer a couple of them You know, that is not something that we talked about in the meeting that I was in, but I can talk to it. I don't want to go too far if this isn't where you want to go with this, but um, just uh, when will we be seeing the final version of the course catalog before it gets um, the, the, the process? I think it's usually in February. It starts moving. Um, yeah. yeah, so Joan started working on it this week, and then she and I, and then when she's in next week, um, we'll sort of the so that do we approve it or just review it? Um, I can't remember. Yeah. I think most most places there is an approval of it. At least an approval of the changes. I just have a question about our big boy language because I, I mean, I think I have noticed it in the catalog, and I, I think I know that you know what the classroom looks like at, at Bento. So these are predominantly um, language opportunities for ninth grade to twelfth grade in our high school. And is there is there a big boy in middle school, or just they stop at fifth grade and that's the way to get to high school? There, there is in the middle school right now. We have some difficulties with you. We've got some teachers on the wrong call for a day long. But currently, do we know how how many other school districts across the state offer a Ojibwe at the high school and then across the field? You know, I don't have an exact number. I would just no other comments or questions. Thank you very much, and I appreciate it. I appreciate the work of the board, and especially the uh, work around curriculum. I know that's 
oftentimes a major <laughs> major body of work for the board with, with everything we've been doing with COVID. It's great to see that work continuing as we move forward. Answer, answer your question, yes, the board does approve or adopt um, changes uh, to the course catalog. So the board does um, officially adopt uh, those changes. Our next item is 3B1, Solar Energy Project. Thank you. Yeah. There was a desire for some additional conversation related to our solar energy project uh, discussion that took place at our last meeting. And so that was a requested item um, for further discussion. Thank you. And uh, I can start the conversation and um, Basically, I know that there was an interest from the board in having this as a topic of conversation at our committee the whole meeting um, for a number of reasons. Uh, one of one of which is the the opportunity, the standing opportunity to participate in some grant work with the city uh, and um, related to to solar projects within the schools within the within the district. And uh, we have been working with the climate club from Ordine for, for quite some time. Um, there are there are many things that are when we think about like what what makes us feel really positive, there's many, many things that that club is doing that are that are that are quite positive, that are focused on sustainability, that are focused on social change and environmental change. Um, and when we've worked with them, um, part part of what we've seen is that we we also have some realities of our of our current situation that are impacting our ability to take on additional extra things and I, I it's hard for us to uh, make difficult choices related to to, um, to that type of project but in working with uh, Mr. Spooner and CFO Arison um, our current capacity is is quite limited related to our ability to, to do the extra work of uh, moving forward with solar. However, we're, we're also very committed to it and that there are uh, two rounds of uh, the two rounds of, of funding, one now in January that, that needs to be completed by the end of January if we're moving forward and then another one yet this summer. Yes, we'll and continue for 2025. Mm -hmm. But the, the, the two announced rounds are announced. right now and then uh, May June time frame and what we're what we're talking about a little bit is um, that we do have a we have a deep interest in moving forward with solar and we want to consider how does that fit within the the constellation of everything that we want to work on right we want to work on equity we want to keep working on curriculum we want to work on our strategic plan we want to keep working on COVID where there is absolutely no disinterest in solar um, but we want to consider how does how does this fit, and, and is it something is it something we can do now? And if it is, then I think we should move forward with it. If it's something that we can do soon, then I think we should move forward with it soon. And I think really having having that conversation, allowing the board to hear where we're at um, related to, to that that list of things that we hope to accomplish, that's what we we think is really important to us now. So really want to have. Uh, opportunity for CFO Erickson and uh, Mr. Spooner to talk a little bit about where we're at and where we hope to go with solar. Thank you, Superintendent Vegas, and thank you, board members. Um, we've had some great discussions internally. We've spent um, actually over two years just talking about it. I, I'm just remembering uh, Member Lockler Camp when we went to Ordine and heard them, I think it was in the winter of 2019, maybe. Mm -hmm. um, and at the time, there were more work. I think everyone agreed there was more work to be done and, and more research to be done, and we appreciate the efforts and work that they've done. And at the time, we never even really were thinking about COVID. We didn't understand what the world was going to happen between then and now. And um, Superintendent Vegas uh, sent a letter to the board uh, recently, as well as to our friends at the City of Duluth, kind of just sharing where we were um, logistically and capacity wise um, and we have not we've not changed from that uh, perspective that we just feel at this time in order for us to 
uh, continue focusing on the priority areas within our facilities team, the projects that we need to address. Um, we would really appreciate um, the board's support in giving us some time and knowing that there is opportunity for us to uh, be able to, to, to find a better way to have this fit in than it would be to just rush right now just because there potentially is some funding even though this is a competitive grant process, this is not a guaranteed process. Um, there are going to be, we believe, multiple funding rounds. We feel very positive. Um, I've talked with um, some of our government relations friends um, with the current surplus at the state legislative level. We uh, expect that we may see some additional funding opportunities beyond what was currently passed at last year's legislative session. So, um, and as Superintendent Megas, um, so eloquently and accurately stated, we're just really in a place where we're just hoping um, that we could just give ourselves a little bit of time and grace as a facility team and department uh, to get our planning together, work together, and look at this maybe in a more holistic way. Um, we love the idea at the look, you know, this is kind of a smaller scale, but we really think it's important for us to look at this from a strategic planning standpoint, district-wide, what kind of commitment does the district want to make in terms of uh, climate opportunities and things such as this that may take a larger scale view versus um, this one small first step. And sometimes it seems like, oh, maybe a first step is logical here where it might be easy. Um, this is a little more complicated once you kind of look into it. So um, I guess that's what we're asking for. And I'll pause in case uh, the owner would like to add some other things as well. Thank you, Erickson, we are really stretched to the limit of this plan. It's always my my intent and our, our department's uh, goal to do the best job that we can for every task that we take on. And I think if we were to proceed with solar, I would really like the opportunity to meet the two, two board members at a time and really go over what the solar means and I want to ensure that everybody understands because I look at it from a different lens. I have to say this is the amount of money we're spending and I, I might be needing to see it for our and, and say this is what we're spending and this is how we get a payback. This is how we return on our money and curves. And, and we've got those numbers and it's not something we need to talk about tonight but I really would like to be able to take the pause, get the opportunity to meet with each of you discuss it, make sure we're all on the, the same page, and I'm sure we have a, a curriculum component that is required to apply for this grant in place, and that's pretty comprehensive when I read about that today, that we have to do this, but that's another aspect that we have to consider. But I would ask uh, the same thing as people are asked that uh, we, we take these models and make sure we're, we're doing the right thing for the right reason. Along with that idea of pause, um, I think it needs to be a reflective pause and a, a pause with some action where we um, engage in some conversation with, you know, with the city, with with the entities that, that are doing this, that we continue to explore the grant uh, a little bit longer, that we have uh, conversations with districts, other districts that are, are looking into solar, and that if we're moving in this direction, that we would do so. Uh, you know, take take a serious look at that summer application date for the next round um, as part of that. I guess I have a hard time with the pause because I don't feel like we need to start. Um, and, and, and I, I totally agree with you. We got, and I understand, I get it, that we got a lot going on. Um, Facility wise, our project. I, I just think that. Uh, we need to be looking at the opportunity in front of us here and, and the work that uh, the student group has done that, you know, it, it basically what they presented to us was everything that myself or any other teacher would want to see from the student group in front of us in terms of an educational experience that that these students have. The time and effort and everything they put into it. Um, from community action and the science side of the piece and, and, and working with the numbers. You know, there's so I, what I got from that presentation was 
they're willing to do almost all of it and, and get, bring in the people that will help get this started. And so that's what I would like to hear, is that, you know, I'm not saying this guy is going to be but we need to just, it's okay if it's, if it's looking at these plants that are not that far down the road, get to move them on there and, and let's get this snowball rolling down the hill so that, you know, 15 years, like 2025, we can actually do that solar in the schools instead of waiting to start in 2025. And, and I know we have a lot going on. I think we need find a way to get this project started in small work. And I think, again, once you start, you start small and then build on that, you, you learn from that. You learn. And, and the group that's working on this, you know, they've learned a lot, and, and they're going to learn from it. And in terms of bringing in the right people, the right people to help them, okay. Uh, and last one. I do get to the financial, obviously, um, because what I remember from the presentation. What caught my attention was that this is going to save us six thousand dollars a year, um, and right now six thousand dollars a year versus what? Um, I thought I don't see six thousand dollars in savings as significant as it's like when you're back in a hundred and forty-one million dollar budget. Um, when the amount that we are going to have to put into it, um, the grant isn't going to cover all of the costs. And if that, does the grant, if the grant reimburse costs, I don't, I don't know. Do um, we have to put it all up front and then get reimbursed something? Yeah, you know that's all good. Um, what happens when it breaks? <laughs> what happens? You know, what is the maintenance? What is, you know, those are the questions I have. I don't want to invest a significant amount of money into something that that, that is going to give us a penny. In return, um, I, I I am all for solar. I am thinking if this is if this grant process was at 2025, I would rather be in the last group in 2025 for this to still find for this grant because solar technology can change drastically in the next four years or three years um, because it is being used more and utilized more and there's new ways and new things and. And I don't want to invest in a, in a system now only for it to be outdated in four or five years. Um, we're also replacing items. We have everything that works right now. And we have to actually go in and we can spend money on things to change it. When it works, it's fine now. But yet, we have classrooms and kids that need so much more. Um, we're, not, we, we're talking equity here, and we're not focused on the kids necessarily. We are focused on the kids if we want to say this is great work and they did a fantastic job. Absolutely. Is it practical for us? I'm not convinced yet. And that's just my point of view. I would love to see over. I want to be something that lasts a generation. I don't know that we're at that point yet with where that technology is. Yeah, um, well, I'm really excited we're having this conversation here. And yeah, I do remember uh, CFO Erickson sitting at our dean uh, uh, school and uh, seeing that first presentation. And, and for me, I was just thrilled to death because my work for 25 years was on environmental legislation at the state and at the federal level and motivating uh, people to get involved in legislation, just like the solar on the schools legislation. So uh, what I, I, so I'm, you know, certainly behind the, the concept and the idea. And I think back on some of the questions I had for those students up then about, um, uh, give me some examples of other school districts. I knew some, but I wanted to know, I wanted them to do some of that research as well. and. And so they came back to us with some of that research. And um, 
and as as Member Sandholm said, they, they, they really have really learned a great deal and it's, it's very exciting. Uh, but I, I, I think um, my questions right now is I would love, I would welcome that conversation, Mr. Spooner, to sit down and, and kind of hear from your perspective, you know, wearing my school board member hat. Uh, uh, so I would welcome that. Um, one of the things I liked about the um, presentation, the other, the one that we just had, was um, uh, Mayor uh, Larson mentioned uh, uh, using some of her her staff as resources, and so uh, I I would some of the questions I have about what's working with other school districts or what other school districts are doing, I would love them to help do that research for us, not put it on you. Um, David Spooner, but but see if uh, through some of their resources they could uh, get some presentations from. Red, I, I wrote my notes here: Red Wing, Morris, Chicago, I think Rochester, all are doing something. I, I'd like um, if we could ask Mindy. Mindy, I think is her name from the mm -hmm. city to uh, provide some presentations on what they've done in these other school districts, um, how they proceeded, what the costs were. You know, all those kinds of things that I don't want you to have to do, but I'd like that information um, um, as, as we consider moving forward in any way. And then in terms of like the timing of it, I, I, I do agree. We, we have a lot on our plate, so I could see um, uh, later this summer. I actually, you know, 15 years ago built a house and we were going to put solar in, so I, I did a lot of uh, uh, research at the time, and, and it's really here now. I mean, what we have right now is is working all over. But you know, um, I, um, I I think what we would do as a school district is very different than what I would have done in my own house. So I need to do that comparison as well. And I'd like again more information there. So I guess my reaction is I, I'd like I'd like to continue learning. I'd like to continue exploring this idea. Um, uh, I don't want to put a lot of work on your part, though, so I'd like to take that offer from the city to, 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 to see if they can help educate us more as board members on how other school districts have done this. I just wanted, um, Member Lawler, have you triggered something in my mind? One of the things that um, Dave Spooner and I talked about, along with Superintendent Magus, was looking at maybe a regional partnership with some of our neighboring school districts. While it's great what our, our climate group did, if we can leverage some of the cost factors, and that includes the writing of the grant, um, there's some, it, it's spendy because it's very technical. This isn't something where you just check a couple X's and you submit an application. There's it's a very comprehensive detailed application that will need engineering services in order for us to do it well. And then, as was mentioned, there is a curriculum component to it. Um, so we haven't reached out or done any of that yet, but that was a thought that we had was that, you know, if this is something that um, other districts in our region are going to consider or as an encouragement uh, through um, you know partnership with the city and the county, there's folks at the county level too, so we have neighboring uh, districts in the area. So thank you for reminding me to share that. We think there's actually opportunities to maybe leverage more opportunity if we could just give ourselves a little bit of time to kind of pull this together. So thank you for reminding me of that. So I, my, my last words then is just, I, so I, I, you know, I think I'm expressing I want to see us continue to move in some capacities. Um, but I also want to continue as a board member to be responsible in learning about the finances, learning about uh, the pros and cons of, of and, and the works of these other districts that have moved forward and what can we learn from them. And then also, yeah, the partnerships. Um, I, I, I see lots of opportunity for partnerships and, um, and then that, that curriculum piece. You know, that is a big piece. If that's a big piece of the grant, that, that's a big piece on our, our staff. And we're not talking about David Spooner. We're talking about our other staff. And so 
again, that goes back to what are these other school districts, have they done, or other school districts outside of Minnesota, too, for that matter, around the curriculum piece of it. I know there's resources out there, but we need to kind of tap into them. Okay. Uh, I have a couple comments. One is I, I understand it, and uh, all of the financial things that are being said, I get that. On the other hand, we have a climate that is changing dramatically. And everybody said, not everybody, many people say, well, we can't do it now because it costs too much, because it's this, because it's that. I think we have to tell these kids who will be alive in 2050, I will not. Um, what we've done, and they'll ask, what did you do? Well, it's too costly, so we couldn't do anything. So I think that that's, we have to answer to them, answer to them that question. Um, but I get all the rest of it, and I am I'm looking for more information. Secondly, what about the new building on the hill? So that's a new building. Is there any solar uh, opportunity there, or has it been looked at, or what? We, we did an initial conversation with um, our current uh, project managers. Um, they are looking at some opportunities there. We have not moved forward with any um, specific items. One of the other things that we just talked about kind of in theory at this point was um, to work with the city with a potential partnership with Saturday Properties um, because they're going to have way more roofs than we are. Um, that may show a great opportunity to show that property becoming a more solar friendly area. So we haven't yet had those more specific discussions, but we have brought it forward to our project management team for an assessment at our site. I, I encourage you know, you have to really look at that seriously. I have a son who lives in Germany and solar is everywhere. Mm -hmm. uh, and they've done fine for it. It's not the technology that needs to be developed more to be used. So I think that I just encourage that to be brought up with them. Do I have a I was just going to say, I was, um, I was at that meeting as an observer, and I was so impressed and inspired by all of the young people that were in that group and being moving along with work and dedication was put into it. And the bravery getting up and speaking with um, such a crowd that was there that night so eloquently. Um, that was really impressive. And, you know, I would just be concerned if we just say we're going to put it on pause of what, you know, what that would do to them when they put in all of this effort. Um, I would just be really concerned that they would be disheartened and to your point, um, that was really just about the uh, environmental issues that are around, yeah, in our environment right now, and to, to kind of shore the only people that are caring for them in the future, that we're looking for them. Um, that being said, I told you to get all of the financial issues. I really like the idea of looking up on the hill to it in construction. Um, and I think that there's other other resources out there as well. Um, fully understanding that there's also a capacity issue. Um, I guess I like the idea of maybe instead of bringing it as a pause, bringing it as, okay, well, we need, we need more information. So we're going to need to like, look with you. Um, we're going to really come back to the youth and the things. Of things, okay, we want to we wanna try to do this. Here's some very legitimate concerns and, um, that we need to address. So I think it's, um, it, it was mentioned, you know, the partnerships and the reaching out to the city. I have uh, had conversation with the mayor. We met for an hour or two, uh, you know, over the past couple of, couple of weeks discussing, you know, what could we do with this. It's, um, I think part, part of it is we, the, the month of January is going to be a really tough month for us related to uh, where we're at with the pandemic and, and getting through that month. So part of it is just the month of January is going to be a tough one for us. I think if this was due March 15th, I think that we could we would have you know potential uh, better opportunity for it. But I, what I what I think we need to do is is look at 
um, and I guess pause is the wrong word, I think, move, moving forward with looking at it with, uh, with the, the, the summer phase of funding rather than the January phase of funding, I think is something that, that we could um, deeply explore and have the opportunity, you know, I have, again, I've talked to Mayor Larson, she's out of town, but she's back tomorrow, and we're going to have more conversation, and she recommended that we reach out and have more conversation with Mindy. I think when we are, um, you know, at our MSBA conference next week, or when I'm working with uh, AMSD, I have a lot of connections with Rochester and others, and I think it would be good for us to really talk with them and see how are things moving forward. All I'm saying is right now, um, our facilities crew is is kind of uh, kind of like our bus driver situation. It's it's held together with spit and duct, and duct tape, and and I think getting through this phase for the next few weeks is going to be it's going to be challenging for us. Mm -hmm. things. One, um, back in 2019, um, when we heard the first presentation, and again, um, I've never been so proud of a group of girls. Um, if you notice, there's no boys in this, in this club. It's a 100% female-driven, and it's amazing. I really just want to share just from a personal note how much I've appreciated seeing that. And um, just some reflections that we've had here from a, from a facilities perspective is that um, we we need to be a part of the conversation. You know, one of the challenges that happened was no one was notified that they were coming to the board meeting on the 22nd. We were not prepared to respond. We were not a part of their research and participation and we appreciate that. But the district, the staff and the administration and the departments that are part of that need to be a part of that so that we can do that collaboratively so it feels like we're trying to play catch up so i just hope that you're not seeing this as like we want to say no and what that's one of the hardest things about being in the position that we're in sometimes is that it feels like we're just saying no and that's not what we're saying we just want to do it really well um and oftentimes there's just that one perspective that you're hearing and it sounds really great but it's like Dave Spooner was saying, we'd like the opportunity, as Member Oswald said, to kind of dig in a little bit more to really understand the component pieces, not just the financial, but the logistics and who are really the partners and how can we do this? And do we want to do this bigger than just this? Is there something more that we want to do holistically um, that we can start leveraging and doing this really well? So I just, I really want to say that we want to do this, but we want to do it well. And, and six months is not, I mean, well, it's almost five and a half months, we'll roll it up to, it's not going to be that far before we start 
doing the work. So I just want to just say how much we appreciate what we saw and we just really need to be more a part of it because it was relatively new to all of us too because we weren't really a part of that conversation and we appreciate that great work but that just shows how important collaboration is on all levels so we can participate and support it. So I appreciate the perspectives but we're really just asking for that time and support. So thank you. I just want to say, I was asking you to know about yep. that step in that room with, with that presentation with students and it was inspiring yeah. and I think all of us talked about it with uh, 30, I can't think of her name now. Yeah, some 30 red boobers were coming in here and we saw that at the, at the school board meeting. Um, and they did everything and then some that you know, we probably asked for them to do um, following that January or February 2019 meeting. Um, so, yeah, I just I want to know that we need to forward on this. And I think we need to make commitment to our co students and, and really to our commitment to um, making our contribution to saving energy. Because um, it is. It is Storage is well proven. It's been around for mm -hmm. decades now. And yes, there's other schools across the state that are doing it, and other schools across the country that are doing it. And more and more are going to be doing it. Um, and we need to be in the field. We need to be participating in this project um, and doing our part. So just checking on you know the direction of the board, uh, trying to trying to listen listen to the to the center here. Uh, what I'm hearing is that the, the the board is accepting of our current reality of, of this current time frame, but wanting us to uh, work with uh, the, the city and the student group to examine that that next phase of, of funding. Uh, there there is a uh, a district a school district readiness. Uh, aspect to the first phase of, of funding. So you go through a process of looking at do, what, what is the capacity of our district, how are we able to move forward this. So I think I think that if, if we were even to engage in that and make further determination as to what could be next step, uh, if that's the purview of the board, that if that's the interest of the board, uh, that we move in that direction, uh, I think that we could we could look uh, we, we could go down that road. But I do think that that. Uh, we, we do appreciate as well the flexibility for this current funding cycle. So can I just chime in? Um, is so you know there'd be a Sorry. couple of things as a board we could track the resolution and have it presented at a school board meeting with a, a more formal act meeting. Mm -hmm. yeah, and, that, and the thing that's what we do that maybe would just say would you would you consider could, could we ask you to make the grant available in in the summer cycle? Would that be a realistic ask or not? Don't go into that yet. Just, just thinking about because the other part of it thinks that um, could we have a subcommittee of board members work with a small group of the board meetings to get some of the questions answered that we want answered um, without taking the time for anything else? Don't know if that's a, a possibility. Oh, and again. You know, is the board at least willing to say in the next six weeks we'd like to meet in groups of two with with facilities where they they share with us data and like I'd like to know just tell me how how many hours it would take to make a panel of solar happen at our new facility or at and I know the the group was really focused on our D D but is there a building somewhere else? that actually has better opportunity for our first initial leap into providing solar. And would that would that group of students be willing to, to work with us? So again, I, I also understand that everything we're asking or wanting to ask also puts more work where we're saying we, we don't have capacity, especially now. But um, those are just my thoughts. Step committee. That new building seems like such a a perfect ask, but in my meeting with you on our two on two meetings, maybe I'll figure out 
why that plant or what, what needs to happen first or any of that. It just seems like a good place to start. We have a new facility. I like the partnership though too and that might delay things. Um, but those are my, my comments. I would be much more comfortable if we could have our, our discussions with um, with this winner and the board and before we make any kind of commitment decision, um, something, whatever, whatever it is, and, and we this is this discussion that's wonderful. Um, because, you know, they have points of view that they, that uh, we go, we may not even be thinking of yet, and uh, just like to, you know, do their, their side of it, especially in the winner. I mean, I, I know that, that we can't even get our LPFM Process them because of the supply issues. So, oh, what's you know what's the guarantee that we're even going to get a solar panel right now? Is we can't get a window. Um, those kinds of things. So it, it, it's that kind of stuff that, that we got to see if this is practicable and and um, and it's still moving. It's just not moving in a yes or no direction. It's still exploring. Um, I think those the the kids that came and presented were fantastic, but they also already knew that they were told no by the administration. And so they were coming to see their case to us to go override the administration's thoughts of exactly what they're expecting, that we can't handle this right now. And so I worry about rewarding um, behaviors like that, but yet I want to cheer them on. <laughs> and so let me get more information about about this, and let's see if we can if we can all move forward together. Uh, I was just going to say, um, I think it's a great idea to have a meeting for so many employees as well. Um, but I would really appreciate it if you could give updates on the book as soon as possible. I also had a question about who, because I do agree that that is a step in the right direction moving forward. We're not letting it sit and we're meeting with the people that we need to make these plan move forward. So um, my other question was who is going to be in touch with the group to let them know when this is our next step. Because I do think it's a step we need to do and we can sure that we're all educated on um, all the answers. So I think that's well, I, I, uh, I agree. We should uh, let's make sure we let the group know kind of any next steps, wherever mm -hmm. we're going. I really think that is our staff's role, though, mm -hmm. because, you know, um, I, I, I love, you know, I have my presentation here, all the letters of support. Uh, it's often a strategy you use when you write a grant is to get letters of support. Um, but someone has to bring these people together to, you know, to move things. And, and so that's not going to be us as a select committee of the board. That, that will need to be our staff in some capacity. Um, and, and so um, I, I, I'm hearing um, we want to do this. Um, we just need to figure out does it make sense? Um, does the timing, you know, the timing of it, to even write the grant, to go through this huge grant process, this new exciting opportunity of a grant process. Um, but that, and, and so that's why for me, uh, wanting to uh, have someone, uh, and maybe this could be a role of Mindy, to, to give us background information on how some other school districts did it, so we're not, one, reinventing the wheel, two, um, we maybe will get a sense of how many hours of staff time does it take? How many, you know, some of those kinds of things for a district that has already, that is similar in our size, has done it. So for me, if I want to meet with David, but I also want that to know how other school districts, what time and energy and staff time did they need to, to do what they did? So we can do it better. <laughs> Um, okay. Look at your look at your book, look at the back. There is there is a presentation up there in the school probably uh, probably in the school that yeah. um, yeah. um, at the conference next week. So maybe David and I can sit in that one together. Okay. With triple math on. Thank you.
Yeah, thank you. And um, you know, we want to bring forward the best recommendation we can back to the board. That's our role as teams to come back to the board and share that information. Um, we're absorbing a lot of the information. We're learning and wanting to bring forward um, not just the perspective of the climate club because they bring a great perspective, but that's not the district perspective per se. So we need to also bring those other component pieces together on how we can continue to collaborate. So we would commit to definitely making sure we do outreach. Um, we have been in contact with the building principal because that's how the club system works is that it actually runs through the buildings and the principal and then the coordinator of the club so that we can continue to have you know communication and dialogue um, and then too that we can let them know the tools and and pieces of information we need to put together because i think that was a little bit of a missing piece of how how does it work the other way and then just thinking to when I, I know someone just mentioned another building and it, and I think maybe it was maybe in relation to a district building, but one of the other great opportunities we have here as a community is there are thousands of buildings in Duluth that could emulate solar to see how those projects work and we could be in collaboration and partnership with other entities that, you know, depending on where we see opportunities or we see struggle, we could also be looking at partnerships with other organizations to help build that um, larger scale because the reality and I've heard we, we've learned a lot about solar over the last couple of years too we this isn't something that we haven't started to learn about but truly solar in schools is not a majority right now it's actually quite a minority there's less than 20 percent of schools who have active solar participation throughout the state of Minnesota but that's why we're seeing these grants and other opportunities so more districts can participate on a higher level. So we've been looking at all of that information on how we can continue to be a part of that. But we also want to see how it evolves and grows. And this is where, too, I hope we're advocating at the legislative level to maybe see even more financial support. Um, because that is one of the bigger challenges we see is just the reality of trying to do it. And what scale do we want to do it in as a district? So we appreciate the opportunity to be able to dig in a little bit more be able to come and, and have some dialogue with you all um, as individuals and be able to answer those questions and then um, hopefully propose maybe a more robust uh, solar initiative here for the district, not just a response here, but how do we want to see it in relation to a strategic plan and how does solar build into our district, not just today or tomorrow, but in the coming years as well. So I'm not sure where that all is, but I think that's an education piece we all can start learning together. So thanks again for a great dialogue. We appreciate um, those pieces, but I think what I'm hearing from the board is we need to schedule those uh, small groups two on two um, as soon as we can, and I'll work with uh, Mr. Spooner, um, and we'll probably work with Patty um, to schedule to get your calendar so that we can find time uh, to meet uh, together so we can answer those questions. We're probably going to need a little bit of time to pull data together, so it probably won't be like next week, but we'll try to get it uh, really within a very short period of time. I hope that helps everyone. And, and thanks again for just hearing us out. This was a struggle when we met with Superintendent Magus. We were like, Ugh, this just feels like we want to be on the exciting side of so many things, but we're truly just feeling overwhelmed and, and, it, and it feels bad to share that sometimes, but it was just an honest place where we were right now and um, we just appreciate your thoughtfulness and um, I think we have a great plan moving forward here so thanks for thanks for the great dialogue. And so I think that uh, um, both um, Assistant Superintendent Bonds and CFO Erickson in conjunction with Mr. Spooner can work together for reach out back to the group just to let them know where we're at as well. So uh, Mr. Bonds from the curricular perspective and, and CFO Erickson and Mr. Spooner from the facilities and operations perspective. Thank you for the rich dialogue. Thank you. If we go to our next item, um, the next item is our very own Superintendent Magus uh, presenting a safe learning update. Um, Superintendent Magus, for you. Yours. Thank you. Um, so, and I was going to say the two tie wearing because actually I went to a meeting this morning and I had great to tie around my shoulders when I was heading out to, to my car and. 
checked my car and put on another tie and <laughs> went into my meeting actually wearing a tie around my, my, my shoulder and one here. So two tie wearing, superintendent, Magus. Uh, safe learning plan. You've seen our guiding principles many, many times. Uh, looking at our COVID rates, uh, we have, you can see where they were at the beginning of the school year in the 40s. We had some times going into the, the 60s and 70s into the fall, but then it spiked around uh, the Thanksgiving holiday in the hundreds. Uh, it began dropping it back down into the, the 60s, and now as of uh, a few days ago, we were at uh, nearly 80 uh, for, for our district. So it is going back up, but it's also projected to go back up very, very quickly. And we're seeing in uh, many of the major metro areas um, how quickly it is going up. So as far as our, our um, what, you know, when, when we look at that, you know, sometimes people are thinking, oh, you need to, you need to close a grade level, you need to close a school, you need to go to distance learning. Uh, I just want to remind us that, that there's, uh, when, when people are asking, so what is the threshold? What is the number? What is the criteria? Uh, one thing that has been strongly encouraged by the MBE and, uh, MDH, as well as um, many of the other districts I, I'm, I'm working with, is to think about it more like a set of gauges on a dashboard, as opposed to one single variable that flips the switch. Because uh, we need to look at how how are the variant uh, developments occurring? What are we seeing in other districts? What are we seeing as it advances in areas? Uh, we have to look at what is the current what are the current COVID rates in general as well as what transmission are we seeing throughout the community. And then I think one of the, the most important things is how much transmission are we actually seeing within our schools? Because some of the research also shows that uh, one of the safest places that our students can actually be uh, to not get COVID is actually in our schools as opposed to when, when schools aren't in session. There's been, been research that's shown that as well. Uh, also thinking about our vaccination and booster rates. One thing that has hit us really hard, and we're seeing uh, closures, uh, you'll, you'll look at them probably in the, the uh, Star Telegram, uh, this, this next uh, Star, Star Tribune, in the next um, uh, day or so, there, there are a number of districts in the metro area that are, that are having to close uh, various schools or various levels of schools. Those are actually having probably more to do with the staffing capacities. Uh, partly COVID rates and people being sick, but when the system is operating on a shoestring with staffing, I think that that's really important. Uh, working with um, uh, Director of Human Resources Severance today, we looked we looked at what is you know what what absenteeism are we seeing? What uh, fill rates are we seeing? Uh, right now, we had uh, I think it was around 70-ish teachers that were out today. Uh, and the fill rate for that was under 50%. So usually we're seeing around between uh, 45, 40, 45, 50% uh, fill rate for our teachers. So if we have 10 teachers out, that means we only fill in five of those. When we look at some of the other support positions, it's, it's far worse. Um, when we look at the fill rate for our paraprofessionals, for instance, uh, there's a fill rate of less than 10%. Today our fill rate for paraprofessional positions was 3.9 percent. So if there were 100 paras, there weren't 100 paras, but if there were, it would, we would be um, only three or four of those positions getting filled. So I know I've, I've watched the news, uh, I've read the comments in, uh, from other districts that have had to close schools occasionally, uh, and they're not positive when that has to happen. There's a lot of uh, frustration, but we also think about how often do we go to one of our favorite restaurants and we see, you know, closing early at 8 o'clock due to staffing shortages or uh, now open only, um, you know, Tuesday through Saturday because of staffing. There are, throughout, throughout all industries, there, there are staffing shortages that are affecting us. So, so staffing is one of those serious things that we need to consider. Uh, also, as we talked about with, uh, I remember um, former board member Trinka had brought up Thinking, you know, thinking about hospital capacity and medical capacity too. We have to keep an eye on those hospitals and be good neighbors and make sure that we're in communication to make sure that if if our medical system gets to a point where they say we need to uh, think about dialing back, that we consider that as well. So those are some of the variables that we 
have to keep in mind. Uh, and again, we, so, sometimes it comes down to the very basics, the vaccines, the boosters. Uh, had a great conversation with member Dura Peter today about how uh, having vaccines and having boosters uh, increases your own systems. And I'm probably speaking very, very off, off on this member Kirby, but but increases the system's ability to uh, produce antibodies to fight the virus more effectively. So the, it, it's not just the vaccines that we want to make sure that we're getting, but the boosters are very important. And I really want to take a moment, and we'll, we'll share this more at the uh, regular school board meeting, to say thanks to the community and thanks to the board for those two additional days that we had. That allowed us to have booster clinics before uh, break. In, uh, in a period when we were having a hard time getting the booster clinics as well as to do testing right after break and we heard a lot of positive comments from people about how that ended up working really well as well as being a little bit of respite uh, for individuals. So those uh, safety measures are important. The universal masking piece is still important to us as well. I know a number of districts, it's some, some districts have moved away from it. People have asked are we staying with masks and I think it's important at least for you know, that's the next month to six weeks to, to, to keep things going in that direction, if not longer. Uh, Chair Lopold, I thought you had a question. Well, I thought you were going to go back, but you know, I, we're, we're hearing on national news about the severe shortage of test, test kits, uh, rapid tests, and so I asked Superintendent Vegas how we're at, what, where, where are we at? Um, I've been able to go to Sam's Club fairly often and pick up my supplies, so I, mm -hmm. I don't know if this Minnesota is that ahead or we are let us know we are so great news for isd 709 we initially received close to 6,000 uh, test kits initially that were for students um, and they were required to be only given to students the district then purchased uh, actually through sam club a thousand additional test kits for our staff because at the time we were not being given test kits directly from the state related to staff, it was only for students. So we committed to buying a thousand uh, test kits and those were distributed to all of our sites uh, back in uh, late November, early December. Then we received notification from the Department of Education that they were going to give every district one more set of test kits for both staff and students, so another 10,500 tests. So we already have in stock, we still have well over 5,000 test kits that have not been used yet. Um, the initial ones that are coming in, and this is one of the logistical things that we're dealing with, is that they're coming in 330 boxes, <laughs> giant boxes. So just the capacity of how we're getting them here, then how we're going to redistribute them, so that all students and staff will get one to take home. Then we're going to have an additional order um, we're going to do them in two phases just so cause if, I don't know if you've looked at a test kit um, they don't have a really really long shelf life so we didn't want to take too many test kits and then have them expire if we weren't going to use them because we want to make sure that people that need them get them um, so right now um, Crystal Gill our COVID coordinator is working on the, all of that inventory and now that she has a support person they have it all uh, inventoried uh, digitally so that we can keep track. So we should be seeing, I think, another order of 2,000 test kits will be coming in the next couple weeks. And then we still have uh, on deck for free orders an additional 8,000 kits when we're ready to get more. But we didn't want to overstock ourselves because of the limitation of the uh, shelf life of those. I would just like to thank you for all your efforts in coordinating all of that. Um, I can't imagine what that looks like, that number of kits. Um, and also just getting them into the hands of students. Uh, I think it's really important because then if you have a test, you want to take the test. Mm -hmm. so thank you. I appreciate that and, and I want to give kudos to Crystal Deal, all of our health assistants and health offices in our school buildings, which is where they all landed once they uh, got there. And then just a real shout out to our building administrators and Jason Crane, our uh, special ed person who's been doing a lot of the additional coordination um, and special shout out to our purchasing team, the uh, test kits that we got um, actually was right before Thanksgiving. Now that I think about it, because we distributed them the night before Thanksgiving. Um, 
we turned that around really, really quickly because we were afraid that there wasn't going to be inventory and um, the club was willing to give us two 500 shipments. And we got those turned around in like a day. Um, and our team went above and beyond. We actually scrolled down officially to the in-person in so we could do a rush order versus doing it through the online system. So um, thank you for acknowledging that because our teams have really gone above and beyond to make sure that we have that accessibility. And it's been kind of surprising to hear what's happening in other parts of the country yeah. because we feel so fortunate to have so many right now <laughs> um, and making sure that they get into the hands of the people that need them. I, just, I would like to add my thanks to the team and for the mm -hmm. um, But I want to ask Dr. Kirby a question on this because I, I read something about using these tests and that we, with Omicron, we may actually, so your are doing it in the school to stick, we may actually get better reading. Um, like doing stroke samples versus a no sample, and how we take and manage it um, our, our, our medical personnel in the school is aware of some of these changes maybe that um, are being looked at and, and have been evaluated um, with the use of, of these kind of rapid steps. Because it's okay, it's shown that you can, you can do a note on the April swab or whatever, and it might come up negative. Um, but it's a step in the community, a growth swap, because there's a historic growth in the time. First, thinking the future of the home phone bill. Can you confirm that or add to that? No, I think it depends on the kind of test we're getting. Uh, the sensitivity that is how often a positive is really positive or how often you're getting a negative test is really positive varies on them. But I don't know which kind we are getting, but I know that. You know when you do the nasal one, you really want to get up into the <laughs> top of the thing. And if it's at home and you're doing it to an elementary school kid, it's <laughs> difficult for a parent to do that. I need somebody yeah. who's not afraid. <laughs> so I, I don't know the specific thing. Well, I think that's something to look into. Yeah. I am mean, in for a nursing staff too. I, I'm guessing a lot of these are being used by a nursing staff in school. Uh, no, they're actually not. Um, so these are antigen rapid tests um, that you can take home. Um, there is some complication with doing them in school and not using the rapid test because you have to have um, a waiver to be able to do um, uh, to get um, fluid from a fit. So there, there was some complications, and that was one thing that, um, and I know Crystal's not here, but um, that was one thing that was going to cause um, some issues because we really don't have the staff capacity to be doing tests um, and to be able to follow through on those. So that's why we were really focusing on the um, take home antigen tests. Um, and students can certainly, and staff can do them in school, but we're not actually doing the tests. They're a self test. So they're given and explained to the staff person um, and or the student to take those home. Um, if, a, if a staff person is helping a student, that's not our intention to be doing what you had suggested, the, the throat ones at this time, just because there's some complications in um, being able to be approved for those. Is there any uh, reporting requirement then? Yes. If someone takes it home, and they required them to report back to the school or to someone what the result was? Um, there's an expectation. There is an expectation that you would report back if you get one. But right now, our intention is to give every single person a test to have. Right now, we're only giving them to people who have symptoms um, because we had such a smaller supply. But once we get this uh, 10,000 uh, inventory, then the intention of our health staff is so that everyone has one at home already, so they don't have to wait to get one, so that they could test any time that they're feeling symptoms. But our, our intention always is, if you test positive, you're supposed to let the school district know and then go into our uh, phased approach of um, quarantining or isolation. So each of those factors is important. Uh, we're also having to examine other um, practice changes as we move forward. Um, one thing that we actually enacted today was uh, that, that we're, we have an expectation now of a negative COVID test for overnight athletic travel. We were seeing on a number of our teams, particularly with overnight athletic travel, there was some 
uh, spread within those teams. And so with uh, great support from the, the principals, uh, we're, we're uh, requiring that starting with uh, some of our trips tomorrow that are about to take place. So, so, okay, so somewhere down there, there is group activities, okay. Mm -hmm. other, other activities also have overnight travel besides that. Well. Actually, it probably should be I think the third one activities. says yep. something, but, but you definitely want to have your activity, but you know, yep. you can debate all day. I think there's going to a state tournament. Soon. We actually let's make sure that we add that, and it's, it's uh, great to have that that insight too. Uh, can you go back? So we're um, in addition to uh, making sure that we're testing our athletes before they're out of town overnight, uh, knowing that we have large groups at our athletic events, thinking about our spectators, we're making sure that we're reinforcing safety practices there. Uh, we have we're about to have some really big concerts. Uh, thinking about the Ordean concert where there's over 2,000 people in the, in the gymnasium at the same time. Uh, we talked about different methods of maybe staggering or changing things. And at this point, uh, we've decided uh, to pause on uh, concerts, assemblies and dances and other large group activities, uh, quite possibly through third quarter. We'll have to assess in, a, in another month or so and see where we're at. Uh, but we we don't believe that bring, packing a gym full of kids screaming for a pep rally is a good idea right now. Um, we're also uh, pausing on overnight, uh, current overnight field trips that we have uh, at this point in time. Uh, we have we have, uh, we have that in place already, but we're just continuing on um, pausing with overnight field trips. Uh, looking at, we, for February break, we are pausing on overnight field uh, trips then as well, but looking at our spring break, and having some, some additional discussion because I know that there's some out-of-town trips uh, that are scheduled, but our principals have asked for us to make a decision very soon because there's a lot of work that goes into that. If people are fundraising to go to Washington, D.C. or whatever it may be, um, we, we don't want to put people in a bind where they've raised a bunch of money and they lose, lose their money for those, those trips. Okay, just kind of on this list of, um, are we considering with the February break uh, doing some kind of uh, 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 increased testing um, in alternative sites or? Yeah. I, I think it would be really good for us to, to uh, think about how could we offer, uh, you know, maybe we wouldn't be able to offer a, uh, you know, a day a day off like we had at this time, but at least have testing sites set up in a number of areas, particularly if if the deck isn't open on Monday, like we, we uh, saw with the, the winter holiday. I think having that Monday opportunity, or at least making sure that we're sharing the resources of where to test is really critical for us. Thank you. Um, and this is another pretty significant change, and this is something that I, I want us to uh, think about. A number of districts are moving in this direction too. Uh, at this point, uh, there's a really high level of, of community uh, positivity. And what's happening is we're, we're sending uh, potential exposure potential exposure notification letters uh, multiple times to the same family in multiple days right now. And it's, it's becoming kind of a white noise. Uh, and and for, for us and other districts, I, I was talking to, um, Somebody who's not here right now, and they and they they, uh, they said that they had as a as a parent, they had received four notifications a day quite often, uh, that just receiving many many notifications. So at this point, we, along with most other districts, are looking at pausing or uh, discontinuing the the exposure notification. And there's there, we need to have an assumption that probably during the day, all of us are going to have if if we're amongst other people we're going to have some limited exposure to people who are uh, COVID positive. So that is something that we're looking at. But we need to make sure that we're monitoring and continuing there. We have two pretty major uh, uh, things related to guidance coming out. And I'm sure you saw that, that uh, on January 4th, it was um, uh, out before that as far as um, the, the five-day quarantine, but on January 4th, the CDC said, the CDC said this also applies to schools, that uh, if schools choose to undertake the five-day quarantine, they can. Uh, yesterday, 
MBA and MBE sent additional messaging to school leaders saying that Minnesota was moving forward with uh, allowing for that as well. So, so we can uh, have a five-day quarantine, and we are um, we are we're considering aligning our district practices around that the five-day quarantine. And I think that it's important for us to really balance all the safety factors right now. If, if we can't run schools because we don't have staff because people are quarantined and we put people in a situation where they're less safe because our schools are shut down, that that is, is a, um, a bad recipe for us. But it is, we all go into that, you know, into that conversation with um, some trepidation too, knowing that, that a shortened quarantine means that somebody's symptomatic period might be uh, longer than five days and there is some some chance that, that uh, somebody might come to school with symptoms even though their five-day period is, was over but really that five-day quarantine focuses on being uh, symptom free for a period of time and um, you know we we could have people coming to school with symptoms who are COVID positive uh, but but making sure that we have that five-day minimum of a, of a uh, of a quarantine, I think is really important to us at this point. Can you address us again on when does the five day start? The day that you test positive, that's your first day. Yes. And then five days. Mm -hmm. um, actually, uh, it also it also something can can be when your symptoms started. So if you were incredibly sick yeah. over the weekend and tested positive on a Monday. Uh, at least that was how it was for the 10 day. I, I want to make sure that, that uh, without reading the guidance and having it in front of me right now, it also depends on when your, your significant symptoms start. <coughs> Are we going to require a test after five days for those who have a negative No, because actually you can you still test positive for COVID quite some time after you've had COVID, even if you're out of quarantine. So you can, you can test positive for, for COVID. Um, I, can't remember the time, but I think it's at least you know a month or more after you've had COVID, you can still test positive. And that is not it. That is not my slide. But, uh, the as as we know, and I've talked about in our policy meeting and in other conversations with the board, uh, figuring out where we're at with the mandatory vaccination and and uh, and testing. Uh, presidential order that is actually going before the Supreme Court tomorrow and in our policy committee meeting uh, prior to this meeting we uh, looked at the MSBA uh, model policy that they've shared with us related to um, what we would need to have in place uh, assuming that it's probably going to be upheld um, tomorrow but if it's not then we have to review and revise based on what, what the findings of the Supreme Court are, what the decision is there at that point. So every, sometimes, and I said this in another meeting, sometimes it feels like we're running around at the last minute trying to make things seem sensible and figure out what we're doing, but that's partly because the federal and state governments to some degree are doing the same thing. We are, uh, you know, we're, the uh, CDC announced something, announces something on Tuesday, our, our MDE and MDH are scrambling and district leaders and, and di district associations are pressing on people saying, figure it out, figure it out. And they put out information and then we quickly are trying to react to it. So we know that that is something that is creating coherence in a challenging time is difficult, but we uh, really appreciate that the board has been flexible with us in uh, working on this. And as we go forward in hiring our new communications director, I think it's important for us to consider how uh, how that individual is able to help us uh, create greater coherence in, in the messaging behind these, these changing times. And that is my, that I believe is my last slide. Yes. <coughs> nope. Thank you. Uh, we'll share that concludes our- well, We have a question. Sorry. Sorry, Assistant Superintendent Bonds. I just had a follow-up question just about the um, change in the potential exposure notification. Mm -hmm. um, are we going to, since we're not going to be spending on all those, which makes the list that we've seen, are we going to be spending just a reminder to parents that parents get a 
why the emails are available and all kinds of things. It's nice to get this. It might be nice to get this at the beginning of the year because the real manager is not coming home every day, but maybe mm -hmm. it's just an idea. No, I, and actually that's that's what we talked we talked about that as well. We're in kind of a tough situation where we're between communications people, and mm -hmm. so uh, what we had talked about is making sure that our COVID dashboard was uh, regularly updated and referred to in that that notification or in the, the reminder to parents. But I think in our weekly newsletter, it's important for us to almost have like a, a running banner saying, "Remember, you've probably been exposed to COVID today." Watch your symptoms. Yeah. And I, I think on that same line that if we have some some posts that we can ask each school district or each school to post on their Facebook page so it's consistent around to kind of with some of these reminders as well. I think that would be a good thing. I I, I agree. I, I don't want to overpromise and under deliver being the Sometimes consistency of Facebook posts amongst the different sites has, hasn't been, um, we're, we're not fully consistent yet, but, but I do think that it's, that's a really important way of getting our message out there. And I know Patty is helping keep up our, our Patty's going the extra mile. She's our, our social media person over the past couple of days and, and uh, texting me early in the morning wondering about wind chills and, and we're just trying to make sure that we, we get the message out. Thank you, Patty. So, Assistant Superintendent Bond, yep, we're going to go down to just the other, and if there's nothing on our agenda, and I could wait till after we adjourn, but I did just hand to the board members, we need, and, and CFO Erickson, maybe you can help clarify too, is talking with Executive Secretary Paquette this morning, and, um, is that we need an audit? meeting do we need that next week we do okay um, it's just a review yep. um we had the conversation and we wanted to make sure um, each year um, the auditor does a powerpoint presentation and kind of does a, a just a kind of an overview it, it's a complicated document you'll all get a copy of it once it's, it's been bound and completed but there's just kind of the overarching um, component pieces um, that they wanted to review with us so that that is something that we wanted to do and make sure that that was available and she was available at 6 p.m uh before the school board meeting so we're hoping to just have a committee of the whole so she could have 30 minutes to do that presentation and it's my understanding that you were hoping to have it before you, you had said next week but you're thinking that 18th oh, yeah. 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 oh, okay yep did okay. i get that what you said okay because <laughs> i like it i <laughs> Just, yes. I just wanted to make sure that Yeah, we wanted to do it. I thought it was next week. Yeah, yeah, but that's okay. You can still kind of give give us feedback about it. Um, we also want a closed session. So I don't know if you want that next week or if you want to wait for the following week. I think that there's a desire, you know, from the, the negotiation team to give the board an update on where we're at um, based on, um, you know, where we're at okay. with negotiations. And so we are. Uh, hoping to do so on Tuesday. I did check with um, John Edison. He is not available on Monday, and with us being out uh, for MSBA the rest of the days, Tuesday would be quite likely the only day that would work. So then I just, it, again, and I want to thank Member Lafayette Kent for reminding us too. Sometimes we get a beautiful, but um, there's a lot of options for time, and you could, you know, I, I, you could write that you can give us some feedback of what you want to try to do well john edison would have to be available as well but um but try to give us some feedback i don't know what your work schedules are what time you get done work uh, what time you could start based on what john edison's um deal is and then just some guidelines as we go forward in the next year these next couple questions just say list what days you have more availability if we do have to schedule a closed meeting or something is, is when you know what days are more open to you than others if there's more if you have a flexibility that you can tell me that but it, it might I, I think we'll always try to set out a google or try to get to that specific but generally if we could get some idea about your personal schedule of what time you're done with work could be if you're done with work at three could we start at 3 30 you know those kind of things we're still not sure about committed the whole time we've been pushing it to 5 30 but traditionally it started at 4 30. could we go back to that 
So this is just a quick idea of what I thought about today to get some feedback, but Monday is out. And then are we hoping then next Tuesday, January 18th, we would start at 6 or 5.45 because we will do the audit before the school board meeting. 530, 545, what time? 6 o'clock. 6 o'clock. Yep, 30 minutes. It'll only probably be about 10 minutes. Okay. And then the other consideration is the East Media Center is much more available than the Gen Cell is for both our regular board meeting and a committee to hold meeting. And so um, the Executive Secretary Paquette did look at the availability for this space. And it, it seems more open. I don't know what the thoughts are about that. My thoughts would be um, the center on how often the band plays or whatever's going on in the <laughs> because they play it really good. And it was I didn't hear it. 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 Yeah, just just generally, and I, I see you have it here, but just generally, I know we we always try to, even though it might be for a lengthy meeting, any extra meetings, particular extra meetings, we think are only going to be an hour, um, to keep it on the same days. We already have some regular scheduled meetings, just to, you know. So I um, I will fill that out here, but just kind of for other board members that historically we have tried to do it um, so that we're not having to block out every day of the week for school board but a couple days a week for school board so I hope I hope that that maybe works for everyone's schedule as much as possible so I'm just putting enough block I'm advocating <laughs> <laughs> I think that's generally we try to do that although like what I said for Tuesday, when I thought we had to have the audit by next Tuesday, I said, you know, we could start with HR Finance at 4.30 or 3.30 if everybody got done in time. I don't know. And then we could go to the audit at 4.30 and then close session at 5. But that's a long time. But now we don't have to do the audit. But we do have an HR Finance next Tuesday. It's often advantageous for our legal counsel to be earlier. So it might be might be if, if John Edison is, is done at 3.30 or can join us at 3.30 and all of us could do that and I don't want to you know, suggest that anybody needs to, to take a day off of work or change their work together. That's not the point. But if I've got some idea about what your afternoon schedule is, we could better set a time, start time that works for everybody. And again, any discussion about using this space since it is not does not have an after school program like we see at Genfeld. Would there be a desire to go back to the county starting at four thirty like we used to do? Or do people like five or five thirty because they're coming from United Healthcare? I was gonna say when it was in Ox, four thirty works better, but we're all having to travel now and just the logistics of a lot of us having meetings all the way up until four thirty sometimes makes it challenging but if we know that that's the direction we're going to go in we need to adjust some of our um, we have busy days <laughs> yeah. yes. and I, then I, do you want our our committee meetings here if, we, if those are free or i mean that would be one i think the committee meetings like those are are <laughs> oh, I know, you so those then you don't have to yeah and true, I, true, true. I get it i do appreciate the the board uh when, when possible being flexible and trying to be well, you know the, the earlier meetings are are, are um, Sometimes convenient because you know if we we have a two three hour meeting then then you know we're we're getting home uh, at a, a reasonable time most of us start you know six seven four or five in the morning if it's snowy and so I I, I do appreciate the the uh, I know it takes flexibility on the part of the board to, to come earlier when when uh, to like four thirty but it would be helpful for us and our team I think. And we can we can be flexible on our, our meeting times, I think. But what's the floor? You sure about your pleasure? Yeah, we could go to five. That would be a little bit more of a question. I can understand that if they've got you know some other kind of 
and even within their teens that can <coughs> support their youth. Although we can always cherish, and sometimes they're not even presenting like that, how they do that. I think it's. I think we can adjust our, our times, or we could do 4:45 uh, if there's if if our you know if our team really feels the need to run meetings until 4:30. <laughs> but yeah. but I would I'd rather start at 4:30 just given given uh, the, cold the, the cold, the winter, the darkness, and maybe I'm just tired. So. <laughs> <laughs> okay. We will adjourn, so that just brings it to a fine, fine. We don't, we don't go around and do that. We don't need to follow the